Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uncle Brooke, God bless you, man. It's good to see you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I see the first lady is on. Good afternoon, wife. Good afternoon. I'm going to give a few minutes for a few to come on and we're going to get started. Praise the name of the Lord. Cousin, it's good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you. While we're waiting to get started, I want you to do me a favor. Uh, I want you to share. I want you to like, tag, invite, consider starting a watch party. Help us spread the message. God bless you, Jazz. God bless you, Sister T. Sister, uh, Sister Gant, it is so good to see each and every one of you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We're glad and we're rejoicing therein. It's a good day to be alive. It's a good day to be here in the pastor's study at the Greater Beulah Church, getting ready to uh, study the word of God with you. Uh, it is always good to come and be a part of our Facebook uh, community. And I appreciate you guys. If I have not said it before, I appreciate you for your continued support, your faithfulness to be with us on Sunday mornings in the parking lot, your faithfulness to be with us on Tuesday afternoons in our deeper Bible study, and your faithfulness to be with us on Wednesday mornings uh, in our Golden Ages Bible study. I appreciate you guys uh, for spending uh, this time with us, for being a part of the GB family from wherever you are, be it far or near. God bless you, Sister Sam, because don't nobody call you Cassandra, but the Lord. Yeah, it's, it's good for us to be together. And I appreciate uh, your interactions. I appreciate your regular participation in this. Uh, I want to pray. I want to pray. And after we pray, uh, I want to share some things that's on my heart. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, thank you for bringing us to this opportunity to study your word. We know that the interest of your word gives light, so we pray that as your word is open to us, that our hearts, our minds, our understandings will be enlightened. We know that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so we give you praise and we give you thanks because you are the spirit of truth. And you reveal all things to us in the name of Jesus. Lead us and guide us as we study your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Pastor Smalls, man. It is so good to see you. I've been praying for you this week. You were on my mind. And I, I was going to reach out, but you beat me to it. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, matter of fact, while, while I'm talking about Pastor Smalls, Pastor Smalls has shown himself to be a true friend. Uh, doesn't want anything, but regularly just reaches out to say, hey, man, I'm just checking on you. I'm praying for you and, and making sure that all is well. And I appreciate that from you, Pastor Smalls. And all of us need people in our lives uh, who will be that way, who are not necessarily in it for what they can receive from us, but just want to be a blessing, uh, just want to be a blessing to the relationship. And I, I appreciate people like that. Pastor Trotter, my good friend and my brother, uh, the professor and the chaplain, we love you, man. So so let me let me catch you up to, to what's happening. Uh, and... We'll get into the word tonight. We're going to pick up at Jeremiah 29, where we were on this past Sunday morning. 
as a pastor preacher, I believe in something called a preaching program. And that means that uh, maybe, maybe three or four, possibly six months out, I sit down and I pray and I ask the Lord to share with me what he wants me to preach over an extended period of time. And so week by week, I already know the next passage of scripture that I want to study. I practice that as as I'm trying to be a good steward of my time. Uh, Up above my door here in the study, I wish I could show it to you. There is a verse, one of my favorite verses. I have two, uh, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. And my Old Testament favorite verse, I have it hanging above the door here in the pastor study. It's Psalm 78 and 72, where speaking of David says, So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart, and he guided them with his skillful hands, which is to suggest to us that as a pastor preacher, part of one of the things that I want to do, I don't I don't want to be a lazy cook. I don't want to be a last minute cook. I want I want to I want to be uh, I want to follow the model of my wife if I can if I can say that my wife she'll sit down and she'll write out her meal plan for the week and when she goes to the grocery store she's buying groceries according to the meal plan because she's already pre-planned in her mind what we're going to eat for the week. I'm the same way when it comes to preaching. And so when when we set out uh, to start preparing for the 21 days of prayer coming up August the 9th through August the 30th, I plan and prepare to preach and to teach on prayer through the month of July so that when we got to August, we'd have a biblical foundation uh, for praying according to the scriptures. We, we wanted to have a biblical foundation, which was my plan. But I want you to be open, and this is something that I'm learning that 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 this, this last week, this week has taught me. I we have to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes while we may be in the vein of God, he may want to take us a different route to get us to the same place. He he did say what he said. He does want what he wants. It is his will, but he wants to take us a different route. And so I'm learning, especially last week and this week, and I'm encouraging you to learn to be okay with when God throws a, a, a detour in your plans. See, when I set out, set down and set out the path for this month's preaching, I wanted to preach all of the messages from the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, and we did the messages from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, and we, we were able to study there about uh, the prayer, the prayer practices of the hypocrites, and then we studied Matthew chapter six, verse seven and eight, the prayer practices of the pagans or the or the heathens. And it was my intention to go into the Gospel of Luke and to deal with some of the parables that Jesus teaches about prayer. There, uh, in fact, on sun, on this past Sunday, I wanted to preach from Luke eleven where Jesus tells the parable of the midnight friend. There's a gentleman who who has a visitor that arrives at his house at midnight. Uh, That's not unusual because they would travel in the middle of the night to avoid the heat. And when that friend arrives, the host does not have enough bread uh, to put out the table. He, He doesn't have enough resources to to adequately um, host his guest. So what he does, he goes next door to his neighbor, says to his neighbor, loan me three loaves of bread because I have a guest. 
Now, the neighbor is already in bed with his children. We're assuming, we, we do not know exactly this is a parable, so, so there is no true, uh, true fact behind it other than the fact that Jesus said it. So we can assume that this is a, a typical Palestinian house with one major room and the family rolls out. God bless you, cousin. I love you. Uh, the family rolls out a pallet on the floor and the entire family lays down. The father is lying down with his wife and his children. And the father is speaking to his neighbor on the outside saying, hey, me and my children are already in bed. It's going to be too much for me to get up out of bed, try to move the wooden beam or the metal latch that's locking the door so that I can loan you these three pieces of bread. Not that I cannot do it, I just will not do it. And Jesus comes to the end of the parable and says that the, that the neighbor is not going to give the host the bread because he's a friend. The neighbor is going to give the host the bread because he had the boldness, the shameless audacity to ask for what he needed when he needed. And this text, this is what I wanted to preach on this past weekend. This text is a comparison from the lesser to the greater. Because the, 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 the picture is that you are the supplicant, that you are the host. You are the person going to the neighbor. But the neighbor who is a friend is resistant to giving you an answer. That's the lesser. The greater is that you don't go to a friend, you go to a father. When you go to God in prayer, you're not just calling on a friend. Yes, I know the I know the hymn. I'm aware of the hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs are back. Yes, wonderful. But for the sake of the parable, we're, we're contrasting upward. So we're moving from friendship to kinship. The, the father is not like the neighbor. You don't have to beg him. You don't have to beg him for what you need. It is his good will, his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The Matthew version of the text says that if you being evil will give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give you good things if you would ask him? One, the Luke version of the verse is going to come back and says, if you being evil can give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit if you would ask him for it? So what is he trying to say to us? He is trying to get us to see that where you may have to beg a man, you may have to coerce a man, you may have people in your life that when you go to them and ask them for help, that they're going to drag it out. They're going, they're going to make you beg. They're going to, they're going to call it an importunity. That it's going to be an inconvenience for them to meet your request. But what is God saying? God is saying, while it may be inconvenient for a man to answer your request, it is not an inconvenience to me because I already knew Matthew chapter 6, verse number 8. I already knew what you were going to need before you needed it. And I love you because you're my child. You've been adopted into the family. Romans chapter 8 says that you're not receiving the spirit of, of, uh, of bondage, but you receive the spirit of adoption whereby you cry out, Abba, Father. Okay, you have that Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 type of situation with God that you could come boldly to the throne of grace, that you could come, that you could draw nigh to him with confidence. And when you draw nigh to him, what's going to happen? You're going to obtain mercy. You're going to obtain grace. You're going to obtain help in the time of need. So you should never have a situation in your life where you're afraid to go to God in prayer because God is saying, I'm waiting on you to come. I keep telling you, and this isn't what we preached on Sunday. This is what I wanted to preach on Sunday. That I, I, I keep telling you, Sister Blackman and Brother Reese, I keep telling you 
that there are some things that God will do for you without your asking. And that there's biblical grounds for that. But then there are other things that God will not do for you until you ask. And so God is saying, I am going to sit here and wait for you to ask me. And when you ask me, then I'll do it. But I'm waiting on you to ask. I have what you need. I knew you were going to need it before you needed it. One of the things I wrote in my notes for this past Sunday was that God knew my present need in my past. And he has already in the past made a plan to meet my present need in my future. That what is what, what is new to me is not new to God. God already knew it. And so what did God do? God went ahead and prearranged. Ephesians chapter three, chapter one, verse three. He's already blessed me with every spiritual blessing and it's in the heavenly places. What I need is for God to manifest what he's already given me in the heavens in my present experience. See, see, and, and see, here's the thing. I, I, I'm, I'm, fin I'm finna go somewhere. Bless you, Whitehurst. Because there are some blessings that you're not going to get until you pray. And then there are some blessings that you're not going to get until you give. The reason why that came to mind is if, that Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 said that he's already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. But he said, if you don't give your tithes and your offering, I won't open the windows of heaven. I won't pour out the blessing. So there are some blessings that I need to give for. But then there are other blessings that I need to ask for. And whatever you ask in my name, John chapter 14, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do for you so that my father may be glorified in heaven. And so my desire was to teach you that you can come to God in prayer with boldness. That you don't have to be timid in prayer. That you can take the principles that we've learned in Matthew chapter 6. That we can come to God in our secret closet in full vulnerability. That we can take the mask off and, let, and give God full permission to deal with who we are behind our public persona. That's six. That's five and six. And that I can come to God and I don't have to worry about whether or not he's going to hear me. I don't have to worry about whether or not he knows what I'm going through. I don't have to worry about whether or not he's going to pay attention and be able to respond to my request. I can go to God with fullness and confidence and audacity and shamelessness. And the blessing is, Lord, I'm taking, I, I haven't even got to my text yet, but, but the truth of the matter is that where is the importunity for men, where is the inconvenience for man, where I'm telling the man that I'm going to pay him his three loaves back, and he's still saying that I don't want to get out of my bed to do this for you. God is saying you ain't never got to worry about that for me. It is never an inconvenience for me for you to ask me for what you need. Glory to Jesus. It is never an inconvenience for you to ask God for what you need. That's why that's why I love that song by, by the Georgia, I want to say it's the Georgia Mass Choir that said, is he the Georgia Mass Choir, the Chicago Mass Choir, that said, I can call him in the morning and I can call him in the middle of the night. And it doesn't matter when I call him, he'll make everything all right. You understand? So, so my, my intention was to teach you that this past weekend, but the Holy Spirit, through a series of circumstances, moved my heart in a different way. <clears throat> Let me pause here to say to you that you have to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. There is not a situation in your life that the Holy Spirit does not want to give you instruction and direction. 
Jesus says to us in the gospel of John, he says to us that he is the spirit of truth and his assignment is to lead and to guide you into all truth. His assignment in the earth has been to come alongside you to help. That's why his name is Paracletos. P-A-R-A-C-L-E-T-O-S. Paracletos. He has been sent alongside you to help you. When I taught, taught on this in a previous pastor, I called him heaven's advocate on the earth. And I reminded you of the court advocate. The court advocate is someone who is assigned to you by the court that knows the system, even though you don't know the system. And because he knows the system, he can help you maneuver your way through the system. Now, I'll tell you something else, uh, something else that, that's been turning over in my spirit, that Romans chapter 8 that tells us, that when we do not know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of us, because he knows the mind of God, he helps us in our weakness. And he prays for us through the moanings, through the groanings, through the things that we cannot utter. The Holy Spirit of God is at work in us, communicating to God the secret desires of our heart. And I didn't understand it. I did not understand why my mama was always moaning and groaning. I, I didn't understand. I was my grandmama's baby. I was Mudil's baby. I sat in the chair with Mudil. Sat in the chair with her. And I remember I would sit with Mudil while she was praying. And there would be some times when she was praying and she wouldn't have anything to say. She just hummed and moaned. And I didn't understand it at the time. But now that my understanding has been enlightened through the scripture, I know that what she couldn't say, the Holy Spirit of God got on that moan and that groan. And the Holy Spirit started articulating for her to God what she couldn't put into words. Praise be the name of the Lord. That God, God is so much God that what my consciousness cannot articulate. Hallelujah. That he hears the silent groans of my heart and he knows how to articulate them. He helps me in my infirmity. And so I have to be open. Hear what I'm saying to you tonight. I have to be open to his assistance. See, a lot of us get in trouble with God because we won't let the Holy Ghost help us. I don't, how am I here? Some of us are grieving the heart of the Holy Spirit because he's come to help us, but we won't receive it. We won't acknowledge that it is God. We want to call it mother wit and intuition. Some told me, no, it was some, it was somebody. Hallelujah. And that somebody that knows the mind of Christ is saying to you, there's something down the road. He'll do you like he did Paul. The Bible said Paul was on his way to Jerusalem and he sent the prophet into the room and he took his belt off and wrapped Paul's hands up and tied his hands up and told him, if you go, this is going to happen to you. The Holy Spirit of God can be trying to prevent you from walking into trouble. Hear what I'm saying? That's why you may need to pray before you decide just to leave the house. Holy Spirit, is it okay? Do I have your clearance? And I'll tell you, you, you may not want to tell the truth about it, but I'll tell the truth about it on myself. That there's been some times where I picked up my keys to walk out of my house and there was a discomfort in my spirit and I put them keys down and I said, oh. Come to find out. Where I was headed was a car accident. I didn't understand why they were telling me not to go, but the Holy Spirit of God was advising them, telling them to tell me not to go. And found out after the fact that there were guns at the party. Four-star shooting. Some of you 
are frustrating the Holy Spirit frustrating the grace of God because God has assigned the Holy Spirit in your life to help you. And yes, you do have him if you are saved for you are baptized into the body by the Spirit. That when you got saved, he moved in on the inside so that he could cause the work of God to make manifest in your life. Can't no man say Jesus is Lord without the power of the Holy Ghost, according to the scripture. And so, so you need to learn, you need to learn to embrace, hallelujah, the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost will tell you to be quiet. Come on, Marty, you ain't got to the text yet. The Holy Ghost will tell you to hush your mouth. The Holy Ghost will tell you, sit still. The Holy Ghost will tell you, now is the time to move. He'll give you here. You need some Bible language because y'all don't like this Holy Ghost talk. Bible language said that the Holy Ghost bears witness with your spirit. That here's our language. He will confirm for you what you heard from God because he ain't got nothing to say other than what he heard Jesus say. So if you got somebody telling you that the Holy Ghost says something that they can't line up with the scripture, they are a liar. And the Bible says in Galatians, even if an angel come and says something other than you heard us say, let him be a curse. So this week, as I desired to teach you from the book of Luke, the Holy Spirit began to turn me through a series of events toward the passage that we did teach from the book of Jeremiah 29. And this passage in Jeremiah 29 is very interesting because we're 29 chapters into the book and Jeremiah is writing a letter uh, and the letter is addressed to the elders and the priests and the prophets and the people who are in exile. So we already know Nebuchadnezzar has come in and has uh, he has taken the people of God captive and they have gone into captivity. They have gone into a season of judgment. Hear me now. They have gone into a season of judgment. And when Jeremiah writes this letter, I didn't get to preach this on Sunday, but this is important. Bless you, Floyd Trotter, man. I've been praying for you and my niece. Y'all been on my heart. Even on last week, I've been praying for you. This is something important that you don't need to miss. Jeremiah 29, verse number four. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Can't run past that. Because too many people want to say that Babylon is of the devil. That the enemy came in and the enemy did this and the enemy did that. No, baby. It ain't the enemy. He may have been, uh, he may be an enemy, but he's being used by God. God said that was not the enemy. That was me that sent you. You know what I'm telling you tonight? It was not the enemy that sent you into exile. The enemy was an instrument in the hand of God. I did this. <laughs> you need to get that in your heart. That what's happening in your life, what's going on in your life right now, came not from the enemy, but from God. And you are praying against what God has done. 
You're fighting against what God, you're trying to get out of what God has done. But I thought you said God's will is what I want. I thought you said the safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God. And God is saying, I sent you into exile, but you're trying to get out. Can I help you with that? Maybe the reason why you can't identify that this is truly the will of God is because there are voices that you trust who are telling you lies. I'm telling you. Because here it is. I'm coming back, I'm coming back to verse 5, but when you come down to verse 8, Verse 8 says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you and do not listen to the dreams which they dream for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. You have some people, some prominent people, some people that you trust. Some people on your TV that you sent your partner off with. Y'all just bear with me. I, I, I'm just trying to talk about the Bible. So, some of these same folks that you ran and got in their blessing line. The Bible declares that God in this season, has not sent them. Well, at one time, Pastor, they were telling the truth. At one time, the message that they were preaching was for real. They were, they were, uh, at one time, they were accurate. What they said worked for me. Well, and I'll take you to the book of 2 Kings, 1 Kings, and the Bible says that God allowed a lying spirit to get into the mouths of the prophets because he wanted judgment to visit the house. <laughs> and so you have some people out here who are speaking a false narrative. Mm -hmm. They want you to believe COVID is going to be over tomorrow. They all on their on their Facebook live and they all on social media blowing at it. When I showed you in Isaiah 26 and 20 that it has to run its course. That's why we are praying. That's why we're having the study now on prayer. That's why uh, that's why. August the 9th through August the 30th, we're going to have 21 days of prayer. That's why the revival, August 5, 6, and 7, is going to be focused on prayer. That's why we're praying over water and blessing oil, because it's focused on prayer, because we need to hide in prayer until the indignation has run its course. God said, I'll put you there. And some of the people that you trust, glory to God, are trying to convince you that what I did ain't what I did. But listen here now. Hear what I'm trying to tell you tonight. The word of the Lord is sure. I'm back at verse four. Don't you believe? I didn't send them, but I'll tell you what you do need to do. Build, verse 5, build houses and live in them. Plant vineyards, plant gardens, and eat their produce. Take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, and multiply there, and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city which I have sent you 
into exile and pray the Lord on his behalf for in its welfare, you will have welfare. I got to say something that I couldn't say Sunday. I got to say something I couldn't say Sunday. I got carried away trying to preach this and then say what I say what I'm going to say to you now. For the true child of God that hears the voice of God, not through a man, but through this word, this is not the season for you to lose. It may feel like a losing season. It may look like a losing season. But the COVID, the fear, the wearing the mask, all of that may make the, the social unrest, the racial disparities. It may make you feel like you're not going to be successful and prosperous, but God has so ordained this season. Hear me what I'm telling you. God has so ordained this season that you could come out of this season better than you went into it. God has so arranged this that you do not have to decrease. You can increase in this season. That you can come out, that the, the, the ground is ready, the ground is right. Go on in there and invest if you, if you feel led of the Lord to do so. Go on and buy that house if you feel led to do so. It is a buyer's market. Go on and start the business. Set out your plan. Start the business. I'm telling you now, this ain't going to be over soon. So go ahead, take you a month or two and put your business plan together and get yourself ready to go into why. Because God has so ordained it that while the world is going through pandemic, you can prosper. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to bless you right now. I'm trying to convince you. I'm trying to raise your confidence and your faith up to understand that you can come out of this situation much better than you came in. And I don't care how old you are or how young you are. I don't care what your situation is. By the time COVID is over, your circumstances can be totally different. Your way of life can be totally different. Put your mask on. He said in this text right here in Jeremiah 29, I need you to go ahead and, and build your house now. Plant your vineyard. Don't get married. Don't marry off your children. Make sure your children are having children because this ain't the time to decrease. See, what the devil is trying to make you make you convinced of, what the devil is trying to persuade you of is that because of what's happening around us, because of what's happening in politics, because of what's happening in race relations, because of the health disparity, Georgia is a red zone. Every 100 and 100,000 people that get tested are going to have COVID. One in every 10 tests is going to test positive. That's the reality right now. But it don't have to be that way for you. You live in another society. I told you when you were studying Philippians with me that you come from a kingdom of heaven. You're not from this kingdom. And so you don't have to behave or be subject to the limitations of this kingdom. Glory to God. Sow that seed. Go ahead. Put that seed in the ground now. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you blessed here. Can I tell you what's going to be the key to your prosperity in the midst of the pandemic? I'll tell you what it is. The key to your prosperity is that God, by his Holy Spirit, is going to give you wisdom. And when he gives you that wisdom, that wisdom is going to be the answer to somebody's problem. And people will pay you to answer their problem. <laughs> Lord, I'm talking good this evening. I said, people will pay you to solve their problem. Right now, the world is looking for somebody to solve this education problem. And the Holy Spirit of God may talk to one of the 14 people that's watching me right now, 14 or more people that's watching me right now, and give you a witty idea, give you a supernatural insight that's going to change the course of history. And because you heard from God, now your family, 
and your family's family down to the second and the third generation is blessed because you heard from God in the midst of a pandemic. God said, while those false prophets are saying it's going to be over tomorrow, they had already told you it was going to be over by Passover. Then it was going to be over by Pentecost. Now it's supposed to be over in September. No, baby, I can't tell you when it's going to be over. But what I can tell you is build your house. Plant your vineyard. Because when you get your harvest off your vineyard, there's going to be more grapes. <laughs> than you can eat by yourself. It's going to be more grapes than you can make wine for yourself. So now take the extra and sell it, make a profit. What did he tell the widow woman in the book of 2 Kings? He said, close the door and pour the oil. And as often as she had a vessel, she kept pouring the oil. And what did the prophet say to her? Now you go and sell the oil, pay your debt, then you live off the rest. God is trying to set you up so that you can increase and prosper. Because even though you're in the midst of pandemic, even though you're in exile, God's mind concerning you has not changed. That's what I got to get you to see. God's mind about you has not changed. See, let me... let. Let me give you a preview of what I'm going to tell you on Sunday and over into next week. I, I, I'm preaching from 2 Chronicles for the next two weeks, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And one of the things that, that the Holy Spirit has shared with me from 2 Chronicles chapter 7 is that God is so committed to being in relationship with you that he will send affliction if it drives you to him. If it means, glory to Jesus, if it means sending trouble your way so that your relationship can be the same or better, so that you don't run from him, so that your relationship with him doesn't drift off, he will send affliction, the Bible says, in his faithfulness, he sent affliction. Hear it again. Psalm said it in his faithfulness. He sent affliction because he wants you to seek him. So it doesn't matter what your circumstances look like. It doesn't matter what your situation looks like. It doesn't matter what you feel or, or, or what you think. It doesn't matter what the doctor's report was. It doesn't matter what your financial uh, status looks like. It doesn't matter what your credit report is. God's mind, what he thinks about you, has not changed. And so if he has to send the pestilence to make you seek him, okay, I'll send the pestilence because I need you to come to me. I don't need you running away. From, I know, no, I will cause the circumstances of your life to be of such that you will run to me. And if that means I got to let you go hungry, if that means I got to cause trouble in your relationship, if that means I got to let sickness invade your body, whatever it takes to make you seek me, I'm willing to do that. Because I love you so much, I'm not willing to lose you to your circumstances. I'm not willing to lose you to what you think is a blessing. I'm not willing to lose you. So I will send the affliction. That's why James said, you got to learn how to count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptation. Why? Because you know. That the trying of your faith is going to work out patience. It's going to work out endurance. And what did Romans chapter 5 say? That we know that endurance brings about experience. And experience brings about hope. And my hope won't let me be ashamed. 
And I know I got a few people on here. God bless you, Dr. Lett. I got a few people watching me right now who has that same testimony that I've had to endure some hardships. But in my endurance, I've gained experience with God. And so that now I'm in a bad situation again. My hope in God is still intact because I've endured my experience. And so Jeremiah says, I know you're in, in Babylon. I know you're in captivity, but I don't want you to get sidetracked. I don't want you to be mistaken. God still wants to prosper you in the midst of a pandemic. He still wants to raise you up. Come on, think about it. Think about it. Daniel is an exile in Babylon. And God has raised him up to the second highest office in his land. Three Hebrew boys are exiles in Babylon, but they are princes in the city. Come on, Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king. He has direct access to royalty in Babylon. It's a different scenario, but it's the same principle. Joseph is in uh, Joseph is in Egypt, and he becomes the second in command in the midst of a bad situation. What am I trying to get you to see that it doesn't mean? It does not have to mean that this is going to work out for your bad. We know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and that are called according to his purpose. Why? Because Jeremiah 29 is going to tell us that God, verse 10, is going to complete he says, listen to this. I want to read this because we love verse 11, but we don't get it in context. Thus says the Lord, when the 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I am going to visit you. Hear this. I am going to fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. Why are you going to visit me? Why are you going to bring this good word to pass? Because I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Listen, before you ever went into this season, before you ever came into this season of life, God already knew you were coming. I keep telling you that God starts at the end, works his way back to the beginning, and he plans the journey for your success. God has already concluded and decided in his mind that on the other end of this, you're going to be blessed. That every word that he's spoken over your life, he's going to bring it to pass. Not one word, not one good word from God is going to fall to the ground. I need you to get that in your spirit. I need you to be convinced of that. I need you to be persuaded of that. that not one word. So if that means that Jesus has said to me in his word that he came not to steal, kill, and destroy, that was the thief. He says, but I have come the same verse that you may have life. And that you may have life more abundantly. That John says in 3 John verse number 2. That, that I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health. Even as your soul prospers. That he said in the book of Psalms. I want to satisfy you with long life. That he said in Psalms. That if you, if you delight yourself in me, I want to give you the desires of your heart. I want you to have the testimony that you were young and now that you're old, you've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed beg bread. 
that you know for a surety that the steps of good men and women are ordered by the Lord. God said, not one word of that is going to fall to the ground. Yeah, you're going to have some enemies and they're going to form some weapons, but no weapon formed against you is going to prosper because that's what he said. I read to you every day for a week last week what Jesus, what, what God said in Isaiah 55, that that word that goes forth out of my mouth shall not return to me void, but it shall prosper in the thing where until I sent it, and it shall accomplish the thing that I've called it to do. I am trying to get you to be convinced of the fact that God is not a man, that he should ever have to lie, and he's not the son of man, that he should ever have to repent. If he said a thing, he's God enough to do it, and if he spoke it, he's God enough to bring it to pass. Every word that he said to you, he gonna bring it to pass. If that means your child being saved, he promised how soul salvation, he gonna do it. And my job now is to hold fast to my confidence in spite of what it looks like. Hear what I'm telling you? Because what's gonna happen, and th th this is what I, this is one of the things that I said to you on Sunday, that a lot of us deal when things, when it take God a long time to do what he said he's going to do, we experience a thing called discouragement. We get discouraged in the way. Our heart, according to the book of Proverbs, our heart becomes sick because we've been praying and praying and believing God and trusting God and it never comes to pass. We can't see it happening. But what you don't realize is that while you can't see him working, God is at work behind the scenes. You don't know what God is doing in the heart of your child right now. You, you don't know the conversation that's happening between your child and the Lord that you don't know nothing about. And it may not be visible on the outside, but if there's a seed there, the Holy Ghost knows how to till the soil of that heart so that at the right time, like I told you on last Wednesday, most of our problem is not with the promise, it is with the time. Uh, most of us have a problem with the timing of God. We want God to do it on our time, but the book said, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, that God makes all things beautiful in his own time. There's a time and a season for everything under the heaven and the earth. God can be working without your, without your permission. He could be working. God can be working without you knowing he works. God can be working without having to use you to do his work. Oh, see, some of us are too nosy. We want to play God. Okay. Come on in, Pastor. It's 53. God says, I know. I know what it looks like. I don't want you to get discouraged. The plan of the enemy is to get you discouraged so you can give up your faith. So you can stop holding on to your confidence. Because now, because I'm going to tell you what happens. It takes longer than you expected. So now you start asking questions. It takes longer than you expected. So you start asking questions. And now that you've started asking questions, now doubts start coming in. And now that doubt has turned from doubt into unbelief. And now that unbelief has set in, the book said, now you can't receive from the Lord. You can't receive from him. Why? Because he said, those who doubt, let him not believe, not think that he'll receive anything from the Lord, for that man is unstable in all his ways. So the Lord sends a word to you on a Tuesday night from Jeremiah 29 so that you can have something to hold on to when the questions come. Because though you may not be able to answer why he has not answered yet, 
you can respond to that question with, he may not have answered yet, but he knows the thoughts that he thinks towards me. And his thoughts are good. They're for my welfare. They're for my best interests, not for evil. Thoughts to give me a hope and a future and an expected end. So what I got to do now is the closing of the text. Come in, man. Come on, Mark. Come on, Mark. All right. Okay, here, here, here's the end. Here's the end. So since I know that God's word has not changed concerning my circumstance, now we come back to the main premise of our study. And this is this is amazing that God and his wisdom would bring us to this like this. So what happens? He says, so now you can call me and come and pray to me and I will listen. He says, when you pray, I'm going to listen when you seek me. Ain't that what I just told you? That God is completely committed to your seeking him? And when you seek me, you will find me, but you got to search for me with your whole heart. So we're back at prayer. That my prayer life is not based on my stance in my circumstance. My prayer life is based on my stance on the word of God. And the word of God told me, Matthew chapter six, verse number six, that God was calling for me to go into my secret closet and to shut the door and to stay in that secret closet Isaiah 26 and 20 until the until the indignation has run its course. And then when he brings me out of prayer, my God who sees in secret, my father who sees in secret, what's going to happen? He is going to reward me. Well, pastor, how you get to that from from Jeremiah 29, well, Jeremiah 29, verse 14 says, I will be found by you, and I will restore your fortunes, and will gather you from all the nations, and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you in the exile. God said, if you spend this time in prayer, if you take the time that I've left you in Babylon, if you take the time that I've told you to hide in your prayer closet, if, I, if you take the time where I've told you to come into the house and shut the door behind you and you spend that time in prayer, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. When I pull the cover and open up that prayer room and let you out of that prayer room, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. It's Isaiah 26 and 20. I'm going to tell you when you come out of that prayer room, I'm going to restore to you what you lost. I am going to recompense to you what the devil stole. And I want to I want to add, I feel led, I feel the impression upon my heart to say that it don't just have to be material things that the Lord restores to you. For some of you, the Lord wants to restore your self-esteem because when you went through that storm, it brought with it a level of shame and embarrassment and guilt. But the Lord said, I want to restore to you your esteem. I want to remind you that you are the apple of my eye. That the reason I brought you into this pr prayer posture, the reason why I'm having you in this extended period in seclusion and isolation in the prayer room is so that I can deal with those private insecurities and restore to you 
What I want to do, I want to deal. Let me pull on my my uh my my uh my psychology hat, my, my counseling hat, and tell you that the Lord wants to silence the voice of your inner critic. I'm close the book. I'm over time. Because some of you, the reason why you can't prosper in the pandemic is because there's a voice in your ear that keeps telling you, no, you can't do that. Remember when they said, remember what happened the last time. And that inner critic works on your esteem. so that your confidence has eroded. But the Holy Spirit of God said, while you're in the prayer room, when you take that mask off that you've been hiding behind, and you let me deal with the vulnerability of your insecurity, when you realize that the only way you're going to be strong is when you come to me with your weakness. Because I know how to give you a sustaining grace. Come in, Mick. Come on. I know how to give you a sustaining grace so that even with your weakness, you can still prosper. And I'm a witness that the Lord will put a hedge of protection around you so that your weakness won't be able to hinder you from walking in his plan for your life. God says, go ahead and get comfortable. I want to prosper you in the midst of the pandemic. I don't want you to decrease. I want you to increase because my thought about you, my plans for you, my mind about you has not changed. And because of that, I'm calling for you to come into your prayer closet. Spend the time in that prayer closet. Because when you come out of that prayer closet, by the time August 30th get here, for some of you, your whole life going to change. By the time August 30th get here, your perspective is going to change. I'm expecting God to give some people some witty ideas. I'm expecting God to give give somebody a business idea. I'm expecting God to, to touch somebody's body and heal and the doctor is going to scratch his head in astonishment because of what happened when you made the conscious decision to go into your prayer room and shut the door and stay there until the trouble passed over. I pray you were blessed tonight. I, I went a little longer than I anticipated. I feel the Lord's presence in this room. He's come and he's visited with us. And I thank him for it. You know, I thank him for it because he comes to help us. Yeah, he comes. He comes to help us. He comes to help us. He sends strength out of Zion and help from the sanctuary. And I, I, I believe right now there's somebody watching who can testify that you feel the help of the Lord. And so I want you to be blessed. Uh, I, I thank you so much for spending this hour with me in the word. I love you so much. Uh, we're getting ready uh, in the morning. Uh, we'll be having Golden Ages Bible study. Pastor Mosley will be teaching. We're getting ready for the month of August. It's going to be an awesome month all month long. We're going to have Park and Praise Revival Edition, uh, August the 5th, 6th, and 7th. And we're looking forward to a great time of revival. We're looking forward to a great time of prayer, August 9th through the 30th. We're looking forward to uh, our all-in Sundays. We're looking forward to what God is going to do. Because I believe, you, I believe as sure as you see my face and hear my, hear my voice, that the Lord wants to prosper you in the midst of a pandemic. Let me pray for you, bless you, and we'll we'll go our way for the evening. Father, in Jesus' name, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for all that you do for us. And now, God, as we leave this place, whenever your presence, we pray that you go with us, 
stand by us, by all accidents and incidents that stand between us and our way. When we arrive at that place, allow us to find all things in divine order. Dispatch angels to guard and protect us. Focus in your bluff, you never lose his power. Holy Spirit, you rest, reign, and rule in our lives. In the name of the risen Savior, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord give you his grace. The Lord turn his face towards you. The Lord give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Peace. I love you.